<laughs> okay, so um, welcome everyone uh, back to the conference, uh, to the evening keynote. Uh, we have a series of uh, two uh, uh, excellent uh, distinguished speakers uh, in the next uh, two hours. Uh, first, um, uh, we are going to hear from uh, Andrew Kambadur, who's a head of uh, AI engineering group at uh, Bloomberg, which consists of uh, nearly 200 uh, different uh, researchers and engineers building uh, financial solutions using machine learning, natural language processing, uh, graph analytics, and uh, uh, other techniques. Um, uh, Anju, uh, before joining Bloomberg, was a research staff member at uh, IBM Reser Research uh, uh, TJ uh, Watson uh, Center, um, and he also holds a PhD from uh, Indiana uh, University. Um, his talk today will be about uh, knowledge graphs and uh, natural language uh, processing and how they apply to uh, financial domain and financial applications. Um, with this, uh, Anju, please uh, take it away. Thanks, Yuri. Um, Maria, let me know when my slides are. Okay, cool. So all set to go. Uh, Yuri, Marco, and the rest of the uh, rest of the community at uh, the web conference. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to give this talk uh, today. Um, so let's get started. Um, my hope today is really to give you some transparency on the kinds of problem that we solve problems we solve in in finance using the knowledge graph, using natural language processing, but really, you know, because the talk is only one hour, we are restricted to that. And I also hope that through the talk, we'll inspire some research, we'll also inspire some collaboration um, in the directions that we feel are very pertinent to finance. So we'll start with a small introduction to finance and Bloomberg, because I don't know how many of the audience members know about finance. We'll, um, we'll also then go to talk a little bit about the motivation why do we care about these things at all? And then we we'll look into the use cases for knowledge graphs. We we'll look into the use cases of natural language processing and then conclude. So moving on. So th the first thing I want to start with is, I think many of us, at least certainly me, when I moved from IBM Research, I had a different notion of what finance was than I have today. I've been at Bloomberg for about seven years now. So finance is not just what we see in the movies. It's not just high frequency trading. Not everything's happening in microseconds. And frankly, not everything is somewhat, you know, um, shady. So finance is a very important aspect of a modern society. Finance is what allows us to finance um, housing loans, innovations, entrepreneurship, for governments to have projects in healthcare or repairing roads, for municipalities to have better education programs, for people to invest in so that they can retire. All of this is funded through finance. So it's a very, very critical aspect of modern living. And like I said, not everything happens in microseconds. There are investment scale, time scale horizons that are milliseconds, seconds, days, even months. Uh, hopefully we'll explore all of this through the stock. So to level set some things, uh, I've, used the, I've used stock exchanges as a way to uh, say this is the finance market, but really there are a lot more instruments than stocks that you can buy and sell and stock exchanges aren't the only place where you can buy and sell them. So the market really consists of uh, a place where you can buy and sell instruments. Obviously, like anything else, you have buy side people and sell side people. Uh, when you think of buy side, you're thinking wealth managers, you're thinking pension funds, you're thinking some sovereign wealth funds like the Norwegian uh, wealth fund, which wants to basically invest some money and make more money out of it. And to cater to these people, you also have the sell side, which, you know, they take private companies public. They also are market makers, so they provide liquidity. So if you want to buy an instrument, you need to find that it's find a seller. So either uh, the seller is somebody you directly know, or you need to go to a market to actually find that. But that's not the entire ecosystem. You do have governments involved because they regulate trade. They also are providers of financial instruments. So governments issue a lot, lot of uh, bonds, for example. There are also analysts. So you know, if you want to buy, let's say, a stock, it's not sufficient to just talk to somebody who might have that stock that you want to buy. You also want to know a little bit more about the company. You want to know its forecast for whether it's going to grow, if it's going to issue dividends, et cetera. So you do have all of these other players that are equally important. And Bloomberg is a place that caters to all of them. 
So every one of the roles depicted here are clients of Bloomberg. So what is the Bloomberg terminal? In short, it's so Bloomberg. Uh, the Bloomberg terminal is one of the products offered by Bloomberg. Arguably, it's the flagship product. It's a software as depicted in the photograph. You can um, you can notice that there are several functions that you can run on Bloomberg, and a function is a very independent piece of uh, functionality that you can use to get information. So, news is a suite of functions. If you want to know about market data or plot some things, that's another suite of functions. And all of these essentially go towards financial decision making. If this seems a bit arbitrary to you, uh, bear with me, and you'll learn you'll learn more later. The key aspect is again the Bloomberg terminal gives you real time news and market data. It gives you the ability to get alerts, recommendations. So it's essentially like a huge real time aggregator of news and analytics on top of those news. And we'll discover what those mean later. And again, it's used by financial professionals all over the world. Um, so anyone I told you, I showed you in the previous slide, uh, they are a part of our universe. So why are we, uh, why are we in, like, you know, is, is Bloomberg just a finance company? Uh, it turns out our clients are in finance. Uh, many, many people that I work with, arguably nearly all the people I work with are technologists like me. So it's a company that's nearly 40 years old. We have 325,000 plus paying clients who use the Bloomberg terminal. They come from a variety of different uh, countries, which means it has nice constraints or opportunities for us to do things that are multilingual, low latency, distributed. Um, we also are about a third engineers. So you'll really see why technology drives our company. Um, and increasingly use open source. We contribute back to open source. We also publish and um, you know, we're we are active in collaborations. We have a data science fellowship. We have data science research grants and such. So with this set, I thought I'd start out with some fun facts. Now, many of you may, uh, may know quite well what stocks are. I mean, if you have a company that's public, you can purchase a share in that company. And when the company does well, you do well as a result. Uh, turns out that bonds, which are essentially do, uh, collateralized debt that are issued by these companies, the market value, the total value of those is nearly twice as much as equities. And if you see the graph, you'll see an interesting dip in 2008 where the stock market crashed and as a result, the equity value went down, but the bonds were relatively unharmed by that. So you'll see that in the first graph on the top right, you'll see that bonds really have a major role um, to play in finance. In the second graph, what I'm depicting is the notional value of trade that happens on any given day. You'll see that equities barely register. I mean, it's still uh, about a quarter trillion dollars, so it's not nothing. Commodities, which are things like oil or gold, they register a little bit more, about half a trillion dollars worth. Bonds, again, make a occurrence. So, like, you know, bonds are around 600 uh, billion dollars. But you'll see that FX, which is uh, Forex, is the foreign exchange, is the largest, most liquid market in the world, with trillions of dollars of um, trillions of dollars worth of trades happening on any given day. Now, the last one, the last picture at the bottom, it talks about a different aspect of it. How many different active securities are there? You'll realize again that equities constitute a very small percentage of instruments, financial instruments that you can buy and sell. Now. Equities still, even though there are about a quarter million equities that you can buy and sell, stocks that you can buy and sell, they constitute a large volume of money. But you'll notice that municipal bonds, which is how local governments might fund projects, uh, or government bonds or corporate debt, uh, they also are quite significant, especially when compared to equities. And what's really interesting is derivatives and structured products like mortgage, mortgage-backed securities, they again constitute a large amount of securities that you can buy and sell. Maybe you uh, individual investors are not, but larger funds might be. And the takeaway message really is to say that finance is a lot more complex and diverse uh, than what is popularly known. Right. So with all this, what's the role of KG or NLP in finance? Historically, we've been able to study things like uh, 
market prices and how one market price might affect the other or how the treasury interest rates might affect some other instrument but increasingly with with natural language processing and machine learning and and graphs becoming more scalable and more um powerful you have this aspect of unstructured data coming to play especially what you can call popularly as alternative data coming into play and we'll see some motivational examples of why this is important at the end of the day what i want to leave you with in this segment is events move markets right whether a company is formed or a company starts a new uh, product or changes the price or there's a litigation or a government issues a new regulation a compliance regulation or maybe there is a import duty uh, that's stipulated events really move markets in that sense as an investor what you really want to do is be able to cover those events as in to be able to discover those events that's one aspect of it that bloomberg helps with which is you know you you need to be able to know of those events the second is if an event happens being able to analyze very quickly what your exposure to that event is is also critical so if there's a merger and an acquisition that's an event so first of all discovering that there's a company that acquired another company that's a very important uh, that's a very important piece of information for many clients who are invested in either of those companies or in the supply chain of those companies but how do you benefit from that event or how do you minimize your loss as a result of that event if it's not a positive event that's the second aspect of it which is decision support and that's really where there are opportunities for uh, for uh, the knowledge graph and nlp to play a role there so in essence you're looking at questions like who can i buy and sell from what should i buy and sell how much should i buy and sell it for if you're a company what should i manufacture who should i really sell this product to and why should i be building out this feature if you're a government what project should i have what is the health of the economy what should i regulate what should i not regulate all of these are questions that um, nlp and kg can help answer and hopefully that is what we'll cover in this talk Uh, okay still seeing the slides so in the next segment i would, would like to walk you through some examples of where it might become apparent what the power of nlp and kg is in finance uh the first one is uh, i've depicted the stock price of tesla as an earnings call was happening so sometime last year there was an earnings call so most publicly traded companies have a quarterly earnings call where the uh, the company has a prepared statement and after the prepared statement some analysts are uh, allowed to ask questions to the management of that company and these earnings calls contain information like information is exchanged during these earnings calls that are very valuable and there are many studies that tell you that the alpha or the the new signal from these earnings call is not recoverable anywhere else so in one such earnings call you have elon musk basically ignoring a question and not even ignoring it in a uh, ignoring a question and as a result because the question was termed, deemed to be pertinent or at least it was correlated with a stock price going down you'll see why if you are an investor you want to tune into earnings calls cuz this is how you know, you um, know when something's going to happen and there's not one company right on any given earning season which is you know once a quarter there's a there's a schedule of earnings reports coming out there are several several calls and you can see why nlp is a powerful tool to use here similarly news moves markets so this is the stock price of another company um there was an sec filing against the company maybe it was a regulation but the important thing is as soon as the headline broke from bloomberg um that is when the information became something that was verified and actionable and you'll see that within the span of 20 minutes there was a 12% change in a uh, in stock prices so this should give you an idea and like you know and it, it might seem that the examples are cherry pick but this repeats fairly often that um uh, being in tune with news is critical if you are an investor and you know obviously these days and when i say these days it's it's been for a while now social media has been a big player in how companies um can communicate with their clientele and how stock markets are correlated uh, picked an example that might be a bit funny but you know it's it's also impactful at the same time so elon musk tweeted out that he loves at sea the stock prices went up and then there was another tweet that said well 
I purchased like you know it was a it was a photograph that essentially was him purchasing something for his pet. You can see the change in stock prices. It was one of the largest intraday jumps in Etsy stock prices. The result it did come down. Just goes on to serve a point that social media is quite powerful. Uh, recently, you've also maybe heard of meme stocks that are trending, and as a result, the stock price is affected. So, keeping an eye out for social media, along with news, along with earnings calls, is really critical. The other piece that might be novel uh, to many of us is this notion that over-the-counter trading which is when you exchange an instrument, whether it's an equity or a commodity or a bond, not through uh, a stock exchange, not through going on through an app like you know Robinhood or Vanguard, but really by talking to people. So you either pick up the phone and call somebody or you email somebody or you instant message somebody. And that is how you transact. Some, you can call it like the good old fashioned way of transacting. And from the previous slide where I depicted the different instruments and their market values, you can see that bonds, commodities, foreign exchange, structured products, derivatives, all of these still predominantly use over-the-counter trading. And what this goes on to show is why it is important for us to facilitate conversations. So dialogue understanding, intent detection, and other things we will discuss later on in the talk, those serve as extremely important aspects of providing um, transparency and insights and analytics to to clients in finance. So you'll see that there's, there's quite a bit of like you know 200 to 500 trillion dollars of notional value. Uh, that's a lot. Um, that's a lot by any stretch of the imagination. And over the counter trading is is a very big aspect of trading in finance. The next piece as to why NLP uh, and KG these are important aspects is just the sheer volume, right? We talked about earnings calls, we talked about news, we talked about social media, but what is not apparent is the fact that you can't just sit and monitor, if you're an investor, uh, regardless of whether you're buy side or sell side, you can't just sit and monitor individual companies. You need to have some form of digesting this information. You want to have some form of alerting based on this, based on your interests. You'll see that from 2008, till 2021 where we are now the number of messages which is all communications put together like emails uh, emails instant messages um, news social media etc that are relevant to finance this is not all the communication in the world it's financially relevant information it's hitting about 200 billion messages per day so you can you can see where um, uh, nlp and kg and even broadly ai has a role to play here now, speaking of KG, um, I think knowledge graphs, especially in this conference, they're a very well understood entity. Um, but I wanted to tease out an example of in finance, why knowledge graphs uh, deserve their own special place and they're so important. What I've depicted is the series of mergers and acquisitions through which JP Morgan and Chase came about. And you'll see that from 1799, which is the first establishment that merged into JP Morgan and Chase all the way till recently, you need a, a, a company as a company is evolving constantly. And in this case, I've only demonstrated the evolution in terms of the mergers and acquisitions. It also evolves in terms of the products that it manufactures or stops manufacturing. It evolves in terms of the people who work for that company. So in finance, it is important for us to keep track of it. Imagine that you are an analyst trying to run a, a trading strategy over the last 10 years worth of data. That 10 years worth of data might be uh, structured or unstructured, so it might have natural text or not. But what is not compromisable is that any time you test a strategy, all of the mechanisms, like any models that you use, have to be accurate as of that date. You cannot use information from the future to predict the past. And the knowledge graph is really the first step at, of making that uh, reality, of ensuring that you maintain accurate information. Uh, so knowledge graphs are really fun uh, in general, but in finance, I think the, the constraints in which we operate make it uh, particularly challenging and particularly interesting to me. So in, in short, I hope uh, I've convinced you now that there's a real value 
when it comes to finance to use uh, knowledge graphs to use natural language processing to be able to add structure uh, to all of the data that we are seeing and in the next few slides we'll see exactly how you can extract value from this data so i'm going to briefly pause okay looks like i can continue so the bloomberg knowledge graph so here's a depiction of some of the aspects of the bloomberg knowledge graph um it's a graph like most knowledge graphs it's a graph centric representation of entities and relationships in the financial uh, world the bloomberg knowledge graph is special arguably it's one of the most comprehensive pieces of financial information you can find anywhere in particular it is cross domain which means that it can go across traditionally siloed pieces of information like companies industries people who work for those companies instruments and products and brands of those companies all of these are different pieces of information that can be brought together in a single knowledge graph it is consolidated which means that when you go across these silos you have to normalize a lot of things so for example if there's a supply uh, supplier consumer relationship and they are in different countries you want to be able to reason about the different quantities in a uniform way so you want to normalize those aspects a lot of this is also curated uh, remember the cost of getting something wrong in finance is extremely high because um it does move markets when when the information is inaccurate and it moves market for inaccurate reasons what that means is the knowledge graph at bloomberg is curated with human in the loop we have a fantastic set of experts who are curating this information with assistance from machine learning um the other aspect which i alluded to in my example is that we need to be up to date so on any given day uh, a simple example that many of you might recognize or might be familiar with is like a merger and acquisition or an ipo so if you have a knowledge graph that's not up to date um you miss opportunities to do inference on top of that graph especially at boundaries like an i a company going public or a merger and acquisition happening which tend to be the times when you really need the knowledge graph to be up to date and finally we also alluded to this fact that our knowledge graph has to be point in time because we are a global company it also needs to be uh, it also needs to be um uh, multilingual so um i won't spend too much time on this slide um just gives you more concretely what entities are covered what kinds of relationships are covered obviously things like companies people and literals are there the industry segments and the business segments and the products and the brands and the instruments that are issued by these companies all of those are there as well we also capture geographical information where factories are located this helps you really do powerful inference when there is uh, an event um that is of a geographical nature you're also you know you also store a lot of important relationships obviously supply chain is a big one that comes to mind but um, there are other relationships that are stored in the graph that we use fully um in finance and at bloomberg so how do we how do we use the knowledge graph in one sense we can directly use the knowledge graph for inference and i'll get into a couple of examples for that so that's one suite of applications where you have a knowledge graph a jumping off point into the knowledge graph for example a company that you are interested in and you want to propagate some piece of information through that graph through that node and see what comes out and the second is using that knowledge graph indirectly and an important example is perhaps named entity linking so it's an important task in in finance which is to be able to say which entities occur in which documents because entities are really a great way to analyze an entire corpus an entire corpus together uh, the knowledge graph provides a very powerful mechanism to build strong entity linking models so what does this all mean um, concretely so it's important for us to understand events and entities form a great bridge between different events so here there's a there's an example of uh, the british prime minister meeting an irish leader for talks and you can see through the entities that occur in that story a lot of other analysis you can these can serve as jumping off points for further analysis that you want to um, want to perform on any one of these individuals or on any companies that might spring out and more importantly you want to contextualize these entities as well so 
in this case i'm showing i'm showing you a story where uh, intel shares declined it's an automated story which is something we'll get into later in the talk which is you know many other stories are uh, are automated at bloomberg and it's one thing to look at the the content directly which is you know you're a you're a person who holds interest in intel and then you're looking at the story and maybe you're taking actions in it what's more important are the supply chain relationships that allow you to expand your universe of impact and therefore opportunity and you'll see that because we have quantifiable facts stored in the supply chain aspect of our knowledge graph we are able to tell you the exposure of an event to different downstream and upstream tasks in this case you're able to see that uh, some indirect suppliers are affected as a result as well um, of this uh, of this event and again i keep coming back to i love having like a single example i can use over and over again so like a merger and an acquisition is a great example that way so if you are a supplier to a company that got acquired you want to know uh, you want to know how it affects your business if you are a person who holds interest in the company that supplies to the company that got acquired again you want to know because you want to know how the exposure for you and the risks for you and the opportunities for you change as a result and all of this is kind of driven by our knowledge graph and remember the subgraph that i'm showing you is contextually relevant and some of the aspects of what i'm showing you are learned uh, from data and the reason is many of these companies of course when i show a simple example it might look simple um, by construction but when you talk of companies like intel these are companies that have a large set of products a large set of supply chain relationships so to contextualize the relationships to only tease apart those um, impacted supply chain relationships and quantifying them as to the level of impact is actually a very fun problem to solve Here's another um, example that you might have uh, you might have seen. So uh, there's a semiconductor. There was a semiconductor shortage, or maybe there still is. And we wanted to study how there are bottlenecks in the semiconductor manufacturing um, pipeline. So what I've shown is the downstream consumers of the of the Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company, and it turns out that there are very few number of foundries which. can manufacture chips and TSMC the Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company happens to be one of those and obviously it has downstream uh, consumers like Apple and Samsung and Amazon and what not but it turns out that there are many other companies that you might not think about which are fabulous which is you know the Qualcomm Broadcom Nvidia AMDs of the world they also use TSMC to to print out these chips so you can start studying the exposure of any event that you're interested in through the knowledge graph this way um so uh, you know hopefully you'll you'll get inspired by this the other thing you can do is actually use uh, the graph for inference so uh, one of the things that we did late last year or maybe like mid last year was when covid-19 hit we wanted to study the impact of covid-19 on different industry segments both directly and indirectly um and uh, in the interest of time i'm going to skip to the results so one thing that you can see is the first thing we did was we took all of the news stories covid covid 19 for us was a topic that we had curated so we had topic classification around that and then we discovered all the entities that were co-occurring with covid 19 stories so these entities tend to be companies so if you just look at the companies and then roll them up into their industry segments you can come up with a top Ten list of industries that were immediately impacted directly by COVID nineteen. So large pharmaceuticals and cruise lines, obvious candidates. If if uh, I may, something interesting happens when you actually move beyond that to look at direct suppliers and uh, downstream and upstream of the supply chain. And these rankings are really by our prediction on the impact of so, so the ag aggregate. revenue impact due to covid-19 because of the supply chain you'll start seeing some some themes come up like the technology distributor segment or the consumer discretionary um, segment these also are affected so again like you know the knowledge graph really enables all of this analysis and it does so in a quantifiable basis so this is not just about saying x is impacted it's about quantifying how much 
the impact is going to be. Again, uh, one theme I want to come back to over and over again is a lot of this work is all of a lot of this work is hard because of the constraints that we have at uh, in finance of being accurate, of being low latency, of being um, you know up to date, and they. The way we meet all these constraints is by innovation and also by, you know, coming to conferences and and reading papers and collaborating with a lot of you. So uh, research is a huge part of it's a huge part of how we build our products, and I, I suspect it's uh, it's almost impossible to do so without research, and and being in collaboration with academia. Which brings me to my next segment, which is um, how does natural language processing play a role in different aspects of finance. In the interest of time, I've only put three or four um, applications together. If you're interested in more, um, my contact information should be available. Come talk to me. So the first one is about news and its curation and generation, uh, both. So let's look at this slide, which talks about natural documents and what it means. So this is an excerpt from uh, Northrop Grumman. On the top left corner, you can see a chart which depicts how the performance of $100 invested in Northrop Grumman has grown relative to S&P 500, which is in green, and relative to S&P 500's aeronautics index, which is like a subset of um, companies which only focus on the same uh, on the same products as Northrop Grumman. Essentially, the takeaway from here is, you know, the hundred dollars invested directly in Northrop Grumman grow at a faster pace. On this top right corner, you'll see their financial disclosure for uh, the year ending in December thirty first. So it's their uh, it's their filing. And at the bottom, you see a merger and an acquisition report that was filed. Now these are three different pieces of information that you want to be able to deliver to your clients in a structured fashion, and hopefully it jumps out at us that natural language processing, of course, you need some vision, you need some other techniques as well, but natural language processing plays a front and center role in, in being able to do that. For example, one of the things that you can do from natural documents is you can extract and normalize information and make it available as a data frame for customers to both view, if that's what they want to do, or model, like, you know, they can use it as a data set. And here, you know, one of the screens in Bloomberg is FA, which is, uh, you know, the way you can look up fundamentals. You uh, you have a way of analyzing multiple companies together and in comparison with one another by using uh, extractions from tables. The other thing you can do is like Bloomberg is one aspect of Bloomberg is that it's also um, a news organization as in we generate original content. There are 2,700 plus journalists on staff. So we help with assisted stories writing, um, with techniques like clustering, deduplication, summarization, et cetera. We also automate stories end to end, as in completely uh, automated. And you can, um, you can think about the precision that is needed and the latency that is needed. We alluded to some graphs where in a very quick time frame, market moves a lot. So you can, you can, you can appreciate the Precision needs and the latency needs uh, quite a bit here. And the way a simplified pipeline works is um, earnings and filings um, are one aspect of our input. From those, we can extract events like mergers and acquisitions or management changes or any liability exposures or risk exposures that the company might have. From the tables and other uh, other verbiage, we can also extract things like earnings per share or revenue or, you know, forecasts for uh, revenue. And finally, all of this becomes one of two things. Uh, A, you can uh, deliver this as automated news or you can deliver it as a structured feed as well. So it depends on whether the consumer is a human being or a, or a trading box and both are fine. So one, one way in which research plays a role is, um, here's a story that's on the right that I've predicted where there was, um, there was some negative publicity around Bill O'Reilly and there was a lot of public pressure for Fox to act against it. And then finally, the, um, they went their separate ways. Fox and Bill O'Reilly went their separate ways. Now, 
because it was accidentally tagged by some other media as O'Reilly Auto Parts, the stock prices went up because it was generally a positive thing uh, that the public put, perceived this event to be. It was short-lived, but it again goes on to show how being precise is driven by good research and being precise is important. So there's a paper, if you're interested, there's a link there. You can go and read how by modifying objective functions, you can actually get better results for structured prediction, more so than just inference time optimizations that you can come up with. Uh, so again, like the, the takeaway from the slide is like research is a critical aspect of how we build our products. Um, and we are happy to share that as well. The other aspect of Bloomberg is not only do we generate our own news stories, but we are also an aggregator. So we aggregate, there's about 2 million news stories that are delivered every single day. Uh, our index consists of like well over half a billion stories. And there are about 500 documents ingested per second. So I don't even know if this, these are, I think the numbers have only gone up since uh, this, this slide was made. And we can index and deliver them to our clients in, in tens of milliseconds, if not, if not a little more. And that is a staggering scale of operations. And that's why using natural language processing for our clients to be able to consume this information is critical. So for example, uh, if you just want to monitor the news as they're scrolling in, this is what it might look like. Uh, in in fact, during earning seasons, it might scroll through faster than this. So you can see, like you know, there's a huge volume of news. Pretty much all of them are important because these are financially relevant news. Remember, we are already curating the news, and it becomes two million after curation, a day after curation, two million a day after curation. So the need for structuring this content to be able to deliver meaningful insights, uh, hopefully is apparent. So let's look at like, you know, the, the first level of service, if you will. So obviously in the slide, you're seeing somebody type in new, give me news about crude oil and sanctions. And the first level at which we offer natural language processing support, I'll get to that later in the talk, is being able to do autocomplete and also query parsing. But let's ignore that for a moment here. Then what we've done is we've curated crude oil as a topic because it's not just a keyword. We know like, you know, we have thousands of topics that are carefully curated and assigned uh, to different stories as part of our ingestion process. Similarly, with trade sanctions and all of these are, you know, um, retrieved and ranked and then presented to our customers. So this is, I think, the base level of support that, that we offer. But really, often insights don't just come about by one company or one search. It's by looking at a larger time horizon and across segments. So here I've showed, shown you a screen where you can identify trends. And here, the trend screen that's depicted is of trending topics. These are topics that are pre-assigned. So there's a well-defined hierarchy of topics and topic codes. So you'll see that in this case, agricultural chemicals is trending. It's trending because of publication count, delta of publication count. So like it's a trend in the expected publication count being larger than normal. You can plot it if you want um, as a chart. And you can look at some representative content because we're only looking at Twitter volume. You can look at some representative content as well. So this is one way of gaining insight. But Publication volume or might not give you the full insight because the directionality is not implied. So you don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that this publication is spiking. So you can bring in other signals like sentiment and market fundamentals. So in this case, I'm showing you uh, the largest increase by company of publication volume. You're also plotting prices. You're also plotting sentiment. And it shows you that the negative sentiment. So whenever you see red in the sentiment column, chances are that you'll also see red in the, the change in price. It doesn't always happen. It's not a perfect correlation, but it happens more often than not. So again, you're able to gain, you're able to deliver insight to your clients by doing uh, things like sentiment analysis. And we'll go into how we do that later. So everything depicted on the slide is, you know, obviously we are doing entity linking because you have to recognize companies. We are doing salience because it, the, the stories have to be salient to the company. You can't just count a story as being about a company if you don't really know that it's really, really a salient fact about that company. 
and again we are doing sentiment analysis but because the data is well organized you can really slice it and dice it any way you want now here i'm showing you a chart of tesla's uh, stock prices and you can see that what's plotted in the background in blue is the stock price the blue bars represent publication volume and then in the bottom the red and the green represents the sentiment aggregated over some time period and you can see that the sentiment is much better correlated uh, than the publication volume is to the stock prices so you can use these as signals in your trading algorithms or you can use this to make human decisions you can look at this and see what kind of decision you want to take so it doesn't have to be algorithmic all the time now finally again this is a paper that i'm uh, tape a paper that we published in acl last year it's not sufficient for us to be able to deliver news through these views um we are able to deliver hidden themes in real time so here we are showing you a query of amazon and what the screen is showing you is we've taken uh, all the stories that are relevant to amazon over the last two days we are able to cluster them we are able to detect themes we are able to summarize themes or um surface themes in a natural in 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 a in a generated fashion so themes like jeff bezos defends uh, black lives matter banner that's generated we are also able to rank stories in a theme so you know some exemplar stories in a theme and you are able to provide feedback and all of this happens in uh, less than 250 milliseconds for the most part but under a second no matter what and this is a unique system one of its kind and it shows you how powerful uh, using machine learning and natural language processing can be at consuming large volumes of data uh, so it's a fantastic uh, it's a fantastic tool to explore data and i and i really encourage all of you to go take a read at the paper now the other bit is contextualizing trending entities so maybe there is an entity a company or a person who is in news a lot and a key aspect of understanding why is to study other entities that are also uh, able to explain why these entities are uh, are trending and this view is quite powerful for us to be able to explain why an entity is trending through contextual other entities um, as well and again this is a part of a paper that was published in wisdom recently um due to the interest of time i won't go into the details uh, ping me later and i'll be able to um, i'll be able to offer but this is again like a popular way to or a, or a really powerful way to contextualize everything to know why a company or a person might be trending and it uses our entire nlp pipeline again you need to detect entities you need to figure out if things are salient you also need to bring in the knowledge graph because that's how you are able to contextualize things better the other piece is uh, i showed you the evolution of jp morgan chase back from 1799 uh, that paradigm is true for almost any natural language processing model that we build in finance and there's another paper that looked at the effect of not treating uh, our data sets as a natural language processing uh, time series really so typically you have a random train uh dev and test split and you deploy your model and it's used to um make inference or predictions on the future data sets that you receive but here is a study and the graph really shows you if you take a twitter evaluation set from 2019 that was curated for finance and you're trying to do named entity recognition and you use data only from 2014 or only from 2015 or 16 or 17 or 18 you see the improvement in performance as you get closer and closer to the time of the evaluation set now the paper has a lot more details but you can start appreciating why uh temporal drift is a meaningful uh thing for us to address in any of the models that we build so again research informs product in this case similarly when we talk about um when we talk about the data that we are doing inference on they don't all come from a single distribution so there's news there's social media and even in news there are different kinds of news there's broadcast news there's conversations there's another paper um, that was published recently which studies how do you have the best of all worlds where you can have a single model that can 
take um, documents from different genres and make the best predictions um, more so than building domain specific models can. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip over this, but again, I'd, I'd encourage all of you to take a look at it. So we've already touched on some aspects of discovery. I'll, I'll quickly breeze through this and try to wrap up in maybe five minutes to give some uh, time for questions. So there are different role players at Bloomberg. Uh, portfolio managers are one of those. I'll use that as a running example. A portfolio manager, they're responsible for a huge amount of money, like hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more. And their job is to invest them uh, subject to some risk reward constraints. So their job is not that different from the job of a researcher where there's a phase where you're exploring what investments may pan out, doing back testing to figure out how much that strategy would have uh, given them um, if they had implemented it back in time. So there's the similar thing to model development lifecycle that you can that, that you can track there. So discovery is a huge aspect of understanding what's the best um, what's the best investing strategy. So how do we use natural language processing in order to facilitate this? And the motivation slide is this, right? If you want to just look at at and there's a function called DES, which is description of the company in, in a single piece. You'll see that there are some natural language portions which talks about the company's um, charter, if you will. There are some graphs which tell you the uh, the evolution of time series of a variety of different things, uh, like the price in this case. There are some structured data which uh, data points which tell you about the PE ratio or about the dividends. So understanding all of this can be facilitated by NLP a lot, especially because, like I said, we have 10,000 plus functions and each of those functions has many sub bullets. So for example, here you see a profile tab, an issue info tab, a ratios tab, and there are other things that you can sub-select. So uh, it would be wonderful if we could aid discovery by allowing customers to type in natural language questions and just give them answers. So how do we how do we do this at Bloomberg? There are really two approaches to discovery. The first one is we understand that there are lots of different types of information that are needed and simply enabling natural language questions and answering them precisely is one way of doing it. Whether it's over structured data or unstructured data, it doesn't really matter. Structured data would be things like a relational database containing all of the bonds that are active, or textual data might be the news search, like I said. So one of the queries that are depicted here are floating Asian tech bonds maturing in the next 10 years. That's a natural language question and it's answered by a structured data source below, which is facilitated by our natural language parsing framework. The other aspect is order completion because not only does it allow you to save keystrokes, which is not the primary motivation at all, but it allows you to discover new things that you did not know at all. Um, again, we have domain-specific order completes because of the assets like equities, commodities, and um, bonds. All of these have a very different way of querying. And order complete really helps us deliver the full power of the terminal to our clients. So again, it's not just about saving keystrokes, it's actually about uh, facilitating discovery. So the question answering piece of this is being able to understand natural language questions. So I've depicted some questions on the screen. Uh, so for example, in the bond space, you can say show all floating Asian tech bonds maturing in the next 10 years and you'll get an actual answer out of this. What is depicted in the chart is somebody having asked the net income of Google and IBM in the last 20 years. And you can see there's a trend. You can see that Google slowly caught up and then exceeded the net, net income from IBM. Or it might be a question as simple as who are the who are the people who went to University of Michigan who work in Goldman Sachs and in New York office of Goldman Sachs. So question, our question answering framework or query parsing framework really facilitates a lot of ans uh, a lot of natural language questions being able to get exact answers for those. And the way we do this is very modular. Um, and it allows us to, the query I'm depicting here is EPS greater than two in the last five years. EPS is this concept of earnings per share and it's a concept in, in the equity space. And there are multiple ways of interpreting it. So we interpret this into a into a intermediate representation and that can be converted into a query language that's particular to different sources. So here you can see that there's a, there's a modular way to construct this pipeline where you can understand the temporal field 
you can understand the quantity greater than two and there's also a time passer that tells you the time range like within the last five years that you want to query over um it has to be really fast because our query understanding is also our query parsing is also used in order completes because we want to verify if an order complete will result in an actual answer and of course we have we've looked into um and use a lot of neural technologies in in many of the things that i'm sharing with you today so order completion again this is the uh, this is a complement to our query understand our query uh, parsing you've seen that somebody starts typing in google sha and they realize that you can actually do plotting as well you type in trum and you realize that bloomberg also is able to give you tweets that are ordered by likes so we know the concept of likes and we can order by them again just typing in p might get you positive news about facebook at least tells you that sentiment of positive is an understood concept uh, internally the other way to use order complete is often our job is to give the most accurate answers to client queries and order completes help you do query refinement really well in this case you know assets of lloyd you want to be able to at least request the clients for more information if you feel the query is going to be um, spanning too many results so here you say like you know do you want lloyd bank lloyds of london or lloyd blank fine so it's a way to also prune the results and get better answers out again read all about it in the paper um, so in the interest of time i'll i'll move on um, in this slide i think the main takeaway here is we have auto completes and query parsing for different domains like bonds and equities and news and all that At the end of the day we have 10 slots to show all of them and our evaluation metric is did someone get more profitable faster as a result of it so there are some fun challenges there again come talk to me if you want to be if you want to know more about this now the last three slides i'll cover uh, i should be done in about 3 minutes is on conversations and facilitating conversations using nlp i did show you about over the counter trading i also told you about how news moves markets uh, i think the depiction here should show you what happens when there's an event uh, as soon as there is an event people start conversing with one another like i said over the counter trading is a huge thing and these conversations take the form of either emails or instant messages or or telephone conversations you want to be able to facilitate these conversations and i'll talk to you concretely about what that means now i'm going to skip over this slide so here is the workflow that you can think of generally you have an inquiry the inquiry goes goes to the counterparty and in the background a lot of other things happen so when someone gives you an inquiry of like do you want to buy and sell this instrument you want to look up news you want to figure out who is the person inquiring you want to figure out what the price is you also want to uh, figure out what your current portfolio is and ensure that you give a response that is commensurate with your state of affairs and all of these there's a there's a very concrete workflow that you can facilitate using uh using dialogue understanding and there are hundreds of millions of utterances per day so you can appreciate the need for um uh, low latency solutions also high precision solutions so here's a fun exercise and maybe i can i can stop after this and you can read the paper that i've um i've pointed to below and how many of this would have been more fun in a live audience i suppose but named entity linking is a well understood task but in this case this string is the utterance that we receive and the ability to figure out what the character f means whether it's a ticker or it's just noise which turns out it's actually ford whether this is a price yield or a coupon turns out it's coupon which is interest rate whether this is a day month year bid and ask spread so i think the general theme hopefully you are getting is uh whenever it comes to dialogue especially in finance even simple things like entity linking and slot filling take on a different aspect because you're trying to fill this over millions of potential completions that might exist um and we also want to be able to track things like intent which help us further inform our clients on how they can schedule their workflows again the example shown here is you know you want to be able to figure out if there's a bond and detect that or an equity uh in the bottom corner you can see that vodafone is being requested you also want to know like how much is being request requested what price is being offered and what's the intent behind all of this and since many of this happen in group chats 
you also want to be able to uh, tease apart different threads of conversation. Um, all of this, there are some publications you can read about them uh, as well. So again, um, I'd like to conclude my talk with this. There are a lot of publications even in the last six months. Um, so I'll leave the slide on and open it up for questions. Um, thank you very much, Anju, for a very interesting and insightful talk. Uh, super cool stuff you, you guys are doing at uh, Bloomberg. Um, so we have about five minutes uh, left for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, type it in into the chat feature of uh, MeTeam. Uh, you see the chat tab, uh, uh, I think, on the top left corner. You can click that and uh, type a question, and then I will uh, repeat it, and, and you will answer it. Um, so the first question um, comes from uh, Daniel, and it's about how do you deal with truthfulness of facts in your uh, knowledge graph? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and the answer is obviously there are machine learning approaches. When you extract relationships, you can also get a good handle on confidences. You can also cross verify because you're not just looking at one source, you're looking at multiple sources that might carry the same information. But at the end of the day, uh, we do count on human in the loop. We are big believers in augmenting human intelligence. So a lot of the facts in our knowledge graph are facts because humans have verified them. Awesome, because then uh, Munia is asking you, um, you know, awesome talk. Uh, how does your knowledge graph evolve, right? Like, and is uh, is it static long enough for that so that people can curate the knowledge graph? And then she's further thinking, you know, news move fast. Uh, uh, how so? How does this affect kind of the knowledge graph and and the curation part and and the trust? No, that's a, that's a great question. So. The knowledge graph evolves constantly, so it's not like one big version to the next big version because, you know, a new company might come in, a new bond might come in, and, you know, independently you can add those facts in. But at the same time, we also have to be very careful in using the knowledge graph where certain features that are extremely time-dependent might have to rely on a different system for truthfulness as the knowledge graph because knowledge graph for us is a repository of truth and that does take a little more time to verify. So you have auxiliary systems that might be staging grounds for the knowledge graph. And if your application depends on immediate information, you may want to utilize that staging ground as opposed to the knowledge graph. So there is a cascading set of ways in which you can use it. Uh, a great way is, again, like I said, um, bonds, right? They're issued on a daily basis. You may, like, you, know, you may want to use different mechanisms to use that information. Mm -hmm. Can I answer your question? You can ping me later. If I, it, it's actually a very interesting, but I'll, it's hard to summarize that question answer in a, in, in short time. Yeah, these are. I think these are real world issues that are that are hard problems uh, everywhere. Um, there is another a bit a, a bit of a provocative question. Uh, uh, you know, Bloomberg benefits from the open uh, knowledge ecosystem such as Wikipedia and Wikidata that you ingest into your knowledge graph. Um, and, you know, this has been done by many volunteers who work in these ecosystems. Uh, do you have any plans or, uh, you know, how to make this kind of information uh, gathered and make it publicly available and kind of uh, give back uh, to, the, to the ecosystem that in some sense provides, uh, provides input uh, to a lot of what you do? No, that's a great question. And uh, absolutely. I think if if, uh, if you want to ping me offline, I can I can give you a more detailed answer. You can see that we contribute back most of the methodologies uh, that we innovate onto the back to academia. We also have data science grants and fellowships. By the way, there's one coming up. So any of you who are PhD candidates might want to apply. But we are absolutely seeing how we we are absolutely interested in looking forward to like figuring out how we can contribute back to the to different communities. And right now, mostly we are focused on uh, publications. We are also focused on open source contributions. So if anyone has any other ideas, I'd be happy to listen to them. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. Um, another another question was, as you, you mentioned about uh, valid, um, generating uh, news stories, uh, mm -hmm. how are you uh, making sure they are factually correct? Right. So. It all begins first and foremost with sourcing, right? So we have a huge number of journalists. So when we ingest sources, these are very well curated sources. That's number one. The second is I did allude to our modeling, which is extremely targeted for this application to be high precision. So I showed you an example of named entity recognition, but there are several other such 
models that are extremely precise and because you can tease out confidence from all of this there's a human in the loop backstop that allows you to push anything that you are not confident in so at the end of the day it's good old fashioned time series analysis evaluations and having a backstop uh, having like human intelligence to augment you but at the end of the day like they say the proof of the pudding is in the eating uh, you don't hear of too many cases where bloomberg um reports something that's not factually correct and it's done through i guess it's done through like good old fashioned collaboration between journalists and machine learning researchers okay uh, great uh thank you so much um i'm i'm sorry i was not able uh to take all the questions because we are running out of time but uh, really appreciate the talk uh, thank you so much enjoy and 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 great work happening at uh, bloomberg uh, thank you so much thank you again bye bye great bye bye um so um we are now uh, at uh, 10 a.m. pacific time and uh, able uh, to move to the next um, evening uh, keynote um um uh, for today um i'm really uh, happy uh, and excited to be able to present uh, uh, lada damich uh, from facebook uh, who will be giving the talk today um lada was my first uh, summer intern mentor so i was uh, i was her intern long time ago uh, when she was still at um she was at Hewlett Packard Labs and we were working on the dynamics of viral marketing and and how recommendations spread for people to make uh, purchases um and it's a quite uh, well cited paper so it was an, an awesome summer uh, uh thank you lada so uh lada leads the computational social science team uh, at facebook uh, prior joining to facebook she was an associate professor at university of michigan uh, school of information uh, and the center for the study of uh, complex systems and uh Uh, she has done really um, amazing research uh, that centers around information dynamics in networks uh, social ties um, as um, as well as uh, other areas kind of related to computational social science and her work has uh, received a number of uh, awards uh, perhaps most important uh, the lagrange prize in complex systems in 2012 uh, nsf uh, career award um, as well as Uh, University of Michigan uh, Henry Russell uh, award. So um Lada will give the talk today uh, about uh, the geography uh, of uh, social ties and how geographic patterns uh, emerge in social connections uh, emerge from uh, historical uh, borders. Um so uh, thank you so much Lada super excited uh, to have you here and uh, please uh, take it away. Uh thanks you. <laughs> um yes you are also the first intern I ever mentored and it totally messed up my calibration about like what to expect out of a summer internship but um I've um yeah I've recalibrated since. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Uh I will talk today about the uh geography of social ties. Um Let's let me just check how it looks. Okay. I think you can see it. Um which is for the most part based on the friendship uh network that we can see through Facebook. I'll start by telling you about some things that we can learn about interregional and international connectedness from these online friendships. Then I'll um say a few things about how these international ties actually form and finally a couple of examples about how these distant connections affect behavior from uh, social distancing habits during covid to evacuation behavior during hurricanes The first study uh was done by Michael Bailey at Facebook and his collaborators um at Harvard and NYU and Princeton and was based on friendship ties within the United States. They formulated this social connectedness index using de-identified Facebook connections of people who are active within a 30-day window in April of um 2016 in the US. Um and the index just counts the number of connections between 
two counties and normalizes by the populations of those counties. The New York Times created an interactive visualization based on this data. It's lots of fun to explore. I will just show a couple of screenshots. Um, here, for example, if you look at Cook County, Illinois, which is where Chicago is, uh, you can see not just connections to other counties in Illinois and in the Midwest, but also, interestingly, a bunch of um, counties further south. This makes sense if you know some of the history, which I didn't until <laughs> looking at this map, which was that from 1910 to the 1970s, there was a lot of migration from the rural south uh, up into urban counties such as uh, both Cook County or Chicago and also Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Another example is if you look at Kern County in California, as you would expect, uh, it is connected more than, um, so there's like this likelihood of friendship. So what would you expect if everyone in all the counties in the US were connected at random? Well, uh, Kern County is more likely to be connected to neighboring counties within California. But then what are these counties in Oklahoma? Here again, you have to go quite a ways back in history um, to know that in the 1930s, people from Oklahoma um, were migrating west in part because of the Dust Bowl and other um, hardships. And a lot of them were um, uh, settling in Kern County where they were called Okies. Um, Another area is in North Dakota. This is probably much more recent migration because Kern County um, has oil production and uh, North Dakota does as well. So there can be jobs related uh, connections that we see. In general, the implications of social connectedness for two counties is that two counties that are more connected tend to have more trade, they have more job migration, and are more likely to cite each other's patents, importantly. We can also ask how important is it for a county to have a lot of these social ties to other locations within the, the country? In general, as you increase the proportion of friends who live within 100 miles, so this is meaning that a lot of the connections are local, various measures um, tend to degrade. So for example, average income will fall, labor force participation will fall, the percentage of the population that has finished high school falls, um, Economic mobility um, tends to be not as good, social capital, uh, life expectancy, et cetera, and, and teenage birth rate, on the other hand, is likely higher. So we do see that connectedness is a positive feature for different counties. We can further look at how counties connect to other countries. So for example, if we take US counties and their connections to Mexico, we see where um, there has been considerable uh, migration in the past. States um, that have more friendship ties to other countries are more likely to have higher trade and also more individuals who report having ancestry from that country. So, for example, if we look at Italy, its social connectedness index to different counties tends to be higher in coastal areas. This same uh, group of people, plus Bogdan State, who is at the time at Facebook, further wrote two papers that were based on international connections. The, um, the first looked at international trade and international connections, and the second looked more closely at different regions um, within Europe. The data, again, was de-identified 
de-identified Facebook social graph data and location data, and it includes all major countries except for China, Iran, and North Korea. And it uses one cross-sectional snapshot. Um, the data actually is accessible to researchers at the URL below, and I'll share it again at the end of the talk. And the same as we saw for counties, now for countries, I and J, we just look at the number of connections friendship ties between countries I and J, and we normalize by the number of Facebook users within each country. The first thing we notice is that geographic proximity plays a role. So a 10% increase in the distance between two countries is associated with a 10 to 15 decline in their social connectedness. So if we look at Slovenia, for example, um, you uh, see that its social connectedness is higher for neighboring countries, but perhaps there's also a little bit more history there. For example, um, the former, other former Yugoslav republics may be overrepresented or even going further back in history, um, countries that were part or partially <laughs> part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So these factors of common history, maybe common language, common religion, we can see as well if we look at Portugal, for example. So Portugal is connected to its neighbors in Europe, but also through colonial history and language to Brazil and Angola and Guinea-Bissau. Um, it's too small to see on this plot, but Portugal also has high connectedness to Luxembourg, which stems from migration for work in the 1970s. So there, there are these past migrations. Um, further, a further example is one for Turkey, where in the 1960s and 1970s, um, uh, many guest workers from Turkey were working in Germany, and we can see that um, social connectedness to this day. Um, if we look at London, <laughs> we see uh, maybe more recent uh, migration for work. Uh, in part due to countries having within um, the past couple of decades joined the European Union. And um, so sure, like London is connected to other areas of the UK and to Ireland, but also um, some of the Eastern European countries such as uh, Romania and the Baltic Republics. If we compare this against, for example, southern Scotland, it is um, the ties are a bit more uh, local, although maybe some of the same um, regions are highlighted, but certainly you can see more migration to these international uh, hubs of uh, commerce, such as London. The social connectedness index also captures many idiosyncratic stories. So in general, all those variables I've mentioned so far account for about 70% of the variance um, in, in explaining why two countries have the number of friendship ties that they do. But for example, the citizens of Denmark and Australia are 75% more likely to be connected than you would predict. And maybe it could be tied to in 2004, Danish crown, crown Prince Frederick married Australian born Mary Donaldson, which led to increased tourism between the two countries. One final thing, maybe it's a little bit of a puzzle or maybe it's uh, obvious, um, is that if you take two regions within the same country, you can see controlling for all the other variables, like how geographically distant those um, two regions are and, you know, same language, et cetera, et cetera, um, and see how much more the fact that those two regions are in the same country um, predicts their, um, their social connectedness. And, uh, Slovenia actually, maybe because it's a small country, um, has the highest coefficient here. So uh, it's it's much more likely that um, 
uh, regions within Slovenia are connected. And then Croatia, where I'm from originally, is uh, is close behind. Okay, so we saw that there's evidence of this past migration, um, but we didn't look into how important migration is for um, these connections and for tying the world together. So in this study with Gong Kwa Chi, who's now at Facebook, Bogdan, uh, Josh Blumenstock at Berkeley, um, we looked at the role of um, migrants in this global social network. So again, we used the identified profile and social connection data that's available on Facebook. We took as the country of origin what people put in their profile, basically their home city. And for the current country, we took whatever is determined by Facebook based on signals such as uh, IP addresses. We defined migrants to be those whose home country is different from their current country. And international ties are ties where the two people have either different home countries or different current countries. Um, so to validate this um, country to country data set, we compared it against international migrant stocks provided by the World Bank and found a uh, very high uh, correlation between migrant stocks and um, the proportion of people living in a country who are Facebook users who list uh, as their home country, um, the, the country in question. And so here's the uh, maybe startling or maybe expected statistic, which is that while only 17% of all ties on Facebook involve a migrant, 83% of international ties involve at least one migrant. And only 17% of all international ties in our sample are between non-migrants. So migrants are really carrying a lot of um, these international ties. We can look at examples uh, as Sean Taylor did in 2014, where people are not migrating, <laughs> at least not in the long term, uh, but are making international friends. So for example, uh, June of that year was the World Cup and a lot of people left their home country, went to Brazil and made friends. So here the lines, the red lines are between cities in Brazil and uh, cities elsewhere. And uh, they represent in aggregate the new friendships that have formed. And the blue ties, for example, between the UK and Australia are so people from either of those countries went to Brazil and then became friends um, during that uh, during that month. But on average, this produced only one uh, new Brazilian friendship and one new uh, kind of non-Brazilian international friendship. Somewhat more efficiently, if a migrant, uh, for example, leaves uh, their home country and then uh, goes to the new country, um, all of their ties back home become international ties because, because now their current countries are different for, say, their old school friends, etc. And all of the friendships that they'll make in their new country are also international ties because their home countries differ. So it's maybe not as surprising that migrants play such an outsized role. If we look at network composition um, and the percent of ties that are international in, in an individual's ego network, for non-migrants, typically just 10% of the ties are international, but for migrants, something like 90% are. What effect does this have actually in making the world smaller? <laughs> um, to measure this, uh, we approximated uh, or sampled average shortest path between any two people in the world using Facebook um, friendships, so the Facebook social graph. And we constructed a graph where we excluded migrants. So 
it was, you still had international ties, but they had to be between people who were residing in the country where um, they, they were from. And there, the average tortoise path of uh, 3.45 was actually greater than if you put in the migrants. So now you have more nodes in the graph, uh, but the average tortoise path has shrunk. It's uh, 3.37. So migrants actually do make um, the world smaller. And they do this despite actually having a slightly lower degree, a lower average number of friends, uh, but they do have a uh, slightly higher betweenness or higher betweenness. If we look at the number of shortest paths that they're on, for shortest paths that are within the same country, they don't play as much of a role as the locals do. But for shortest paths that are between different countries, um, they, uh, they almost twice as many paths go through them. We can look at some snapshots of ego network structure to try and get a taste, but the, these are just two networks. On the left is a migrant, and you can see in orange, their friends from their home country, in purple, the friends in the new country, and then green are friends from other, um, other countries. And then on the right is a non-migrant, so all of their friends are, um, it looks, wow, <laughs> I guess all of their friends are also locals. Uh, maybe we could also read into that they have slightly more friends uh, and the communities within their network uh, may be larger or denser. This is somewhat reflected in the statistics. Um, so the degree is slightly lower for, for migrants. The density is about the same and the locals have um, a slightly higher number of eight cores and 64 cores. Um, okay, um, last thing about migrant networks is triadic closure. Because you have these different node types, there are people who uh, are locals, there are people who are migrants, and then you can also compare whether they're like locals or migrants in the same country. And what is the likelihood, for example, the very first one here, if you have a local in a country, and they're friends with two migrants in that country who come from the same home country, what is the likelihood that those two migrants know each other? It turns out that probability is elevated because you know chances are kind of lower that you know um, that many migrants by chance. Um, the highest proportion is actually if you're a local in your own country, but you somehow know two migrants in a different country, um, that seems like it would be more of a coincidence and probably by knowing one is how you were introduced um, to the other. On the other hand, if you know just one such person, a migrant in a different country, um, and you also have a local friend, um, the likelihood of closure is, um, is pretty low. So, um, I guess, okay, th this is mostly it for, for this paper, but in the next one, we'll talk a little bit more about the tendencies of migrants to friend locals, which could be part of uh, assimilation, uh, versus their tendency to friend their compatriots. So, but just to recap, who ties the world together? Migrants do, they account for, um, 83% of international ties on Facebook, and they act as a bridging force that shrinks the overall social graph. Okay, the next paper um, looked at immigrant communities just within the United States, um, and it was a collaboration with uh, Amach Bogdan and Winter. So when um, you have an immigrant community, social ties, as I mentioned, uh, play an important role in integrating into the new country, finding support in a community of compatriots, and also staying in touch with friends in one's home country. Just kind of a data validation, if we look at top immigrant communities in the US, it tends to track pretty well with um, the actual kind of statistics for the size of these immigrant communities. 
Just as a sanity check, we can compare compatriot affinity, that is the proportion of one's network that is with people who um, come from the same country, and then the uh, expo what we call exposure, which is the proportion of ties that are to those born in the U.S., so to locals. And as you can imagine, they're inversely um, correlated. Maybe more interestingly is this exposure, that is how many of your ties are to locals, and Victor's Composite Assimilation Index, which has three different components, um, there's the civic component, which I think is like citizenship and military service, the economic component that is like educational and employment attainment. And then the last one is cultural, which is um, language proficiency, intermarriage, et cetera. And um, we find pretty uh, good correlation between this composite assimilation index and exposure, as you might. Uh, expect. Then next, if we also take into account the recency of the migration, and so we do this at the country level, so for example, uh, immigration from India, well, at least in 2017, this was like the average immigration year when we were doing this study. Um, so for India, it's 2006, but for Colombia, Mexico, and the Philippines, it's 2003, and for Germany, it's quite a bit further back in 1985. Um, but if we combine um, this average immigration year and um, um, the, um, and the exposure, we get a pretty good R squared for explaining the, um, the, assim uh, the assimilation index. We can further look at not just friendship with locals, but also friendship with uh, other immigrant communities. And so this is all within the US, but the countries are where people have moved from and you pretty much recreate the different continents. So there is this, whatever we saw that social connectedness index in general between countries, here it is kind of recreated within the United States. The next question is, you know, you may have an affinity for people from your own country, but if there are not many of them living in the States, you may not have that many friends who hail from your country. And indeed, we find this um, not super high, mild correlation between what we call compatriot availability and this compatriot affinity. There's also, uh, okay, so what this plot shows is how distributed the community is across cities in the United States. Um, and basically the more distributed, so it's not that everyone has kind of moved to Chicago or moved to New York or something like that, then the higher the exposure, because within each city, you don't have as many compatriots that you can friend. And indeed, if we look at, so each one of these plots is a country of origin and each point within the plot is um, a city that's sized by the population of, of that city. Um, and then you can see, especially for some countries that the higher the availability, the higher the population from the home country in that city, the more likely, um, or I guess like the the higher the compatriot affinity, meaning that there are more friendship ties formed with people from one's own country. But interestingly, for different countries, the slope and the intercept are different. So maybe for, um, I don't know, English speaking countries such as Canada and the UK, um, there isn't uh, much compatriot affinity, but then for some other countries, it can be uh, higher. Okay, so to summarize, um, I was telling you about the online social network composition of immigrant communities, um, and we saw how it was inter correlated with integration in the host country. All right, um, so in the final part of the talk, I would like to tell you about how 
or why <laughs> um, these geographic patterns in ties matter. So um, I'll go back to this crew of Mike Bailey and collaborators and their study of how um, social networks uh, shaped belief, uh, beliefs and behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic. They used uh, de-identified network data from Facebook, including friendship links and location of friends, uh, individual level location and other characteristics, information on mobility, um, which was just for users with location history settings um, that permitted this. And there were two measures of mobility. Um, one was staying within a home tile of about 600 square meters on a given day. Um, the other was the number of such tiles visited. And further data was public posting behavior and group memberships. If we look at mobility over time, here is the share um, of people who remain in a single tile all day prior to the kind of lockdowns and shelter in place of uh, mid-March in 2020, about 18% of the population would stay within their home tile. And then we see this rising through March and then April. Um, you can also look at the change in average daily tile movement, which kind of does the opposite. Um, it drops and um, this team tried uh, the different measures both ways, but the results were consistent. Next, they looked at um, the exposure of their friends to COVID-19. So where their friends were located and what the case counts were in those areas and the social distancing behavior of the individual. Um, here you see just kind of a, a, a time series, um, average share of days spent in a single tile. So we see this 18% is what we start out with, but we have two curves. One is for people whose friends have above uh, median exposure and um, the red where the friends have below median exposure. And they find this difference. So there's no difference, you know, pre pre pandemic than post pandemic. People whose friends were in areas that were affected, more affected by COVID, um, were more likely to stay um, within the um, within the same tile. Sorry. So that's um, that's these folks. Okay, and so there, there's some issues in inferring that social ties are causing this. For example, there could be correlations in people's abilities to stay, to work from home, or maybe like other geographic factors, et cetera. But um, where the COVID cases were rising and falling in the US varied month by month. And so this created enough different conditions such that um, the, the changes were enough to, to say that this wasn't a factor that, you know, ability to work from home, et cetera, that it actually was the exposure of your friends to COVID. So um, even controlling for cases in one's own area, they were able to show that, and a number of other demographic variables, they were able to show that how affected your friends are affected your own uh, mobility behavior. Not only that, but it also seems to have affected attitudes, you know, um, or behaviors maybe. Um, people who had higher friend exposure, so if you double the, the friend exposure to COVID-19 cases, you see more posts about COVID-19, you see fewer posts opposing social distancing measures, um, a general sentiment decrease, and a lower likelihood of being part of a reopened group. Um, there was another paper um, in PNAS by uh, David Holtz and collaborators that 
used SCI as one of several data sets to try and figure out how different measures, because in the US, <laughs> it, different states and counties and cities took um, or implemented different measures in response to COVID. Uh, and what they found was that um, the lack of coordination between uh, these policies maybe was uh, not as ideal because people's behavior may have been influenced by the social contacts that they had um, in uh, the other places. So to quote them, they say, our analysis shows that the contact patterns of people in a given region are significantly influenced by the policies and behaviors of people in other sometimes distant regions. And they had mentioned, for example, uh, New York and Florida being linked um, in this way. Okay, um, the next study I wanted to talk about was uh, evacuation from hurricanes. This was a study by Denai Metaxa, who was um, at Stanford and then was interning at Facebook, Paige Moss at Facebook, and Daniel Aldrich at Northeastern. Um, they looked at three different hurricanes. One of them was Hurricane Irma, uh, which made landfall in Florida. And then they looked at um, whether people were evacuating the area or not. So this um, hurricane made landfall on September 10th. And you can see six days ahead of time, almost no one is, is moving out. Um, four days ahead, you start to see some movement. And then two days ahead, a significant fraction of people have um, evacuated. And um, so here, these box plots represent different cities that are potentially affected. Um, in So Harvey was Texas, Irma is Florida, and Hurricane Maria was Puerto Rico. So the cities themselves have some variation in the proportion of people who evacuate. Now, what we'd like to know is how one's social network might influence whether someone makes the decision to evacuate. Um, the first measure is that of bonding social capital and kind of proxied by the number of friends one has and the clustering, so the number of ties between one's first degree friends. Um, so this is like basically how tightly tied you are to your community or how tight your community is. The next one is bridging social capital. Um, this is this includes your friends of friends. So how big is your broader social network? And then by connected components, um, thinking maybe back to the migrant ego networks or, or maybe not, but this is like how many different communities are you uh, connecting and basically the more of them there are, the more you play a bridging role between, the more bridging social capital you have. So their results, and they uh, split the population into um, different groups. And um, so group one is the one with fewest friends, or sorry, lowest clustering coefficient here, and then fewest friends here. And they find that bonding social capital is associated with a lower likelihood of evacuating. So potentially um, having many ties within the community means that you're less likely to, to budge. And for Hurricane Maria, they didn't see an effect. Um, they said that perhaps it's because um, it's like evacuating from an island might uh, work a little bit differently. Um, they found then that more bridging social capital, on the other hand, is associated with a higher likelihood of evacuating, uh, both um, for the bi-connected uh, components and for the friends of friends uh, network size. The last kind of social capital they looked at is linking capital, which they operationalized as being connected to politicians or governments on, on Facebook. So uh, potentially people were receiving instructions or advice on evacuating. Um, 
this example doesn't have anything to do with Facebook, but it's just a, a really cute paper in the way that it's designed. It looks at um, people who use a fitness app um, that has a friendship network overlaid, or you can be friends with other people who are running and find out um, you know, how much they've run each day, et cetera, as far as I understand it. Um, and they used weather patterns as an instrumental variable to try and figure out whether there's some social influence in running. Because, for example, I guess on the same day, Chicago and Boston weather are for the most part uncorrelated, but they managed to back out that if in one place there's rain and they know that like when it's raining or they verify that when it's raining, people are less likely to run in the location where it's raining. But they also managed to figure out that people who are connected to people who are in an area where it's raining are less likely to run or maybe run fewer miles, things like that. So there's this like kind of effect uh, at a distance, thanks to these um, geographic like connections that uh, are pretty fi um, far ranging geographically. So that brings me to the end of this talk. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that the geography of ties tells a rich history, and not only that, but that it influences present behavior and so is worthy of study. <laughs> Um, and I would encourage you to uh, download the Social Connectedness Index data set. Uh, hundreds of people have already done so, and there are like dozens of papers now that are uh, coming out. So I hope this is the start of a lot more interesting research. Uh, that's about it. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions, or I see there are some questions. Uh, thank you very much, Lada. This was uh, super cool and uh, a lot of very interesting uh, work and kind of how, how Facebook can serve almost like as a, as a lens, as a telescope into uh, behaviors. So that was great. Um, there is a, a few questions and if people have more questions, please just uh, enter them uh, into the chat. Um, the first question is, uh, given that we are academics, um, you know, Marco is asking, uh, how about academic migration and traveling? Uh, you know, <laughs> is there any analysis of those? Ooh, I don't know, but it seems feasible, right? Because academics will tend to have CVs. They list their affiliations. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they constitute a considerable fraction of these international ties just because they're so likely to uh to move around for work um but i'm not i'm not aware um of specific studies okay uh thank you uh good another question this one is by nadia uh, she's asking are there any insights on how international local connectivity evolves among generations meaning like immigrants and their descendants and uh, anything like that? Oh, yeah, we only saw faint traces of this. So for communities where the main immigration waves were decades earlier, you see much less um, uh, kind of compatriot affinity. But, you know, once you're talking about people who are born in the country and are of a given ancestry, wow. Okay, I, th I think there are studies, but I'm not sure how you would. It's interesting. I don't I don't quite know how you would do it with Facebook data short of, um, yeah, trying to infer ancestry, which would be very iffy. Um, but I, I would imagine that uh, using surveys or um, other methods, you could uh, you could get to the bottom of this. Uh -huh. So are you more worried that somehow it would be hard uh, to label, uh, to kind of find a reliable label for, uh, for who's, a, who's, a, who's an immigrant, who's a descendant and things like that? Is that kind of where you think the challenge Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's like a, a data and, and privacy issue, I think, like, because you would be inferring ancestry, which I don't, you know, Facebook wouldn't be in a position to do. 
Um, but I think if you take another approach of asking people um, to, you know, if they want to participate in the study and uh, kind of volunteer this info, I think it'd be more doable. Okay, that sounds great. And I see two people fiercely typing uh, questions. So uh, <laughs> let's see when my uh, rocket chat uh, uh, updates. Uh, let's see who's who's first. Um, but maybe I ask you a question while uh, people people are typing. Um, uh, so in uh, uh, this uh, uh, COVID uh, COVID analysis was uh, was uh, I thought uh, very uh, very very interesting. Uh, and when you were discussing this kind of lack of uh, coordination. Um, that's uh, it, it has have there been I don't know any estimates about what would be more appropriate or a better way I know to coordinate or you know um, I guess like uh -huh. <laughs> or at least because you have maybe maybe the different question would be given that you have lack of coordination this means you had a lot of natural experiments happening. And natural I, I experiments suppose, are great I mean, because they allow you to isolate factors. It, that is certainly true. I I think if if each local policy were perfect, like a perfect response to the current conditions, then maybe the social ties would only be introducing noise. So where you where you're at is like really bad, and you should definitely be not leaving your home, but most of your friends are in a different region, you know, in New Zealand or something, and everything's just fine there. So you act as if you were in New Zealand. That would not be, yeah, not be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the other hand, um, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there could be some benefit. I, I don't know whether there's like some wisdom of crowds or something like that going on where even if local policies are overreacting or underreacting that through social ties, people learn about conditions and might kind of smooth things out and, uh, I know, behave more like appropriate given the situation. However, I could see it just mostly being detrimental if they're, if they're justified kind of more strict measures and then, um, the social ties are undermining that. I see. I see. And, yeah. and lack of coordination. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an excellent that's an excellent point. Um, another okay. Now questions are coming in. So um, uh, another question is um, uh, talking about uh, weather and people are running. Uh, why do you think is that people don't run when it's rainy uh, near their contacts? Uh, you know, for example, do you think it's exposure to information about rain or is it? Uh, empathy uh, for the con contacts, uh, perhaps. <laughs> no, I, I definitely recommend reading this paper because they look at all sorts of variables. So, um, for example, age and gender and so on. And so one interpretation that they list, which seems very plausible to me, is that people are competitive. So um, if you see that your friends are not running as hard, you also don't run as hard. But if they're like running a lot, then you feel like you have to at least match what they're doing. And there, there are some gender differences. So I'm going to misremember, but I think like men are more likely to influence other men because they're more competitive in this way. But some of the cross gender, um, you didn't uh, see an effect. So I, it makes sense that these apps would would function that way, that the reason you sign up is because like seeing other people um, pushing themselves also pushes you to, to do stuff. And then in case of rain, other people are, you know, they appear to be slacking off, even if you don't know what the weather is in their area, you might also feel like it's OK to slack off. Uh, good. But I, I consult the yeah. paper to find out. <laughs> yeah, the paper is super cool. I, I also recommend uh, reading it. Uh, another question is: Have you looked at the consumption of content, like video, live or not, posts, and so on, uh, between users who are friends uh, from different uh, or the same countries? Oh no, <laughs> I haven't. Perhaps um, others have, but that would be really interesting. I think. 
it, the few times that we've looked at audience for um, uh, pages, for example, that are from a given country, it's surprise. It, it would surprise me how international the audience is, but. Um, I, you know, I haven't looked at it more closely and certainly I would imagine that it's to a large extent also driven by um, social connectedness between um, between the countries. Mm -hmm. um, along these lines, um, there is a question about, you know, could you, around uh, seasonal migrations, uh, both in terms of holidays or uh, seasonal work, could this be kind of studied and spotted in the data? Have you thought about that aspect? Yes, uh, certainly. So <laughs> one uh, seasonal migration that happens, especially in the U.S., where a lot of students go to residential colleges, meaning that they don't um, live at home anymore. So you'll have, like at the start of the semester, a lot of students will then go to their university and then like travel back for Christmas or um, travel back for summer break. Um, that's one big migration, like in non-COVID years or even in COVID years, there's like spring break <laughs> where from the East Coast, a lot of students uh, and uh, older people um, go to Florida. Um, so certainly you could study that and it would be interesting to know whether, um, I mean, we have looked at this a little bit with, um, college networks. Um, if you look at friendship formation between people who go to the same college pretty soon after they arrive, like whether someone at their college is from their hometown doesn't really matter that much. But during the summers, like hometown matters again, because probably they've gone back. So um, it kind of just makes sense wherever you are and wherever people are that you can be friends with. Uh, that's kind of where the new relationships are going to form. Okay, cool. This is great because the next question is super cool. And this one is about what is known about geography distance uh, of ties that are broken, right? Kind of how is, have you studied oh. not only tie creation, but unfriending behavior or lack of interaction or anything like that? Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Cool. No, but I agree that that would be really interesting. I, <laughs> Okay, now I'm not even sure that the following statement is true, but I think stronger ties are less likely to be broken. And you might imagine that over time, um, ties that are more geographically distant would grow weaker. Therefore, you would expect higher likelihood of, um, of unfriending. But even like unfriending itself is like it's like there are different social norms and some areas you have more unfriending than others um so i think it wouldn't be entirely straightforward it's not like everyone has the same propensity to unfriend but certainly haven't looked at geographic distance and i mean yeah right it's like the sad truth like out of sight although you know with facebook you can keep keep in touch, <laughs> um, might be more likely to break. Okay, sorry. Anyway, really cool question. And I don't know the answer. Yeah, no, it's I, I don't think of I actually do you know of any research that would look at uh, these things in let's say the online world, just as a reference? No. Yeah, that's why that I, I, I cannot come up with anything either. So it's a good research, uh, research question. There's still a paper to be written about this. So super. Okay. Um, then uh, next question, going back to COVID, uh, talking about the first uh, lockdown due to COVID, have you looked into migration of uh, users if they traveled back to their home country or did they stay put or you know here oh. in, in you know in San Francisco we saw this exodus and now everyone who from Bay Area now seems to live in Tahoe um, and things like that so uh, have you looked at this no <laughs> it, would be, it would be pretty interesting too like so for 
uh, Facebook has this data for good product called disaster maps. And typically, if there's like a more geographically focused disaster, for example, an earthquake or um, large wildfires or things like that, then Facebook makes available in aggregate what were the movements to other areas like following the disaster and like when did people return. But I think we may have overlooked like the big disaster that was COVID <laughs> just because it was like everywhere. And so I think in principle, one could have, but that that kind of has to be done in the, at the time, just because of like, um, like restrictions on like location data retention. And so I, I don't know that one could do it in retrospect, but maybe you could just look at long term, like for people who have stayed um, and and haven't returned. Maybe one could uh, look into it. All right, good. Uh, there's another question, like kind of you know, it doesn't go without politics. So, um, can you see the effect of politics? You know, I don't know, especially in United, like in United States, uh, red states, blue states, things like that. Is there? Any, do, can, can you see any, any of that in the data? For social connectedness. Connectedness or migration patterns or I don't know. Migration. Ooh. Probably, you, you'd have to disentangle it. So certainly like there are long, like if you look at an urban area like San Francisco, it'll be highly connected to uh, New York and Chicago and uh, I don't know, Seattle or something like that, even though they're very far away. And those will also tend to be like more blue leaning. But is that because of like, is this the social connectedness? Is it just much more likely due to job migration and educational opportunities, things like that? Like whether there's a thing on top that is like, oh, uh, you know, higher affinity for areas that are liberal or conservative. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it would still be there once you remove things like job migration or or other uh, patterns like that. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a very kind of confounded uh, uh, effect that you would uh, that you would see, right? There is a lot of other factors. Uh, to really isolate in detail. Yeah, that's a good a good way to say it. Okay, and perhaps uh, the last question, you know, um, a suggestion that it would be an interesting experiment to correlate media events and migrations, right? In a sense, news plus migrations, uh, especially like, I don't know, in important big people making uh, statements, uh, announcements. Uh, have you looked at any, any of that kind of news plus migration, information plus migration? Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to remember whether... Okay, I see it's Marco who's asking. Can you follow up with me? I think that there was something about... There are a few high profile cases, for example, Tom Hanks, like posting about, uh, or, you know, the news that he had had COVID and so on. And I think there was an attempt to um, see whether that had an effect on people uh, staying home. But I don't, I don't recall now, I think maybe there was, for that little sliver that we looked at, I think maybe there wasn't an effect. But it may very well be that in general, like news does drive it. That would make sense. Okay, um, super. Um, thank you so much, Lada. It was uh, it was great to, uh, to to hear to hear the talk and learn uh, learn so much uh, about this dependence uh, between social ties, uh, geography, events, uh, the insights around COVID. Uh, that was super super cool. So um, thank you so much. It was it was great having you. Um, and um, thank you everyone for uh, attending the, the second day 
of the conference. Uh, we had a great and packed program. Um, thank you for uh, staying with us and uh, uh, see you again uh, tomorrow morning.